Coming up today on Folks, Sonia Massengale continues her report on aging here in Louisiana. We'll visit the University Art Museum in Lafayette and take a look at some Louisiana photography. Our Pause for Pride segment this week features Francis Marsh Ellis, chairman of vocal music at Southern University. I'm Robin Hinton. Those stories and more today on Folks. Everybody says folks, just plain old folks. Everybody just people all over the world. Oh, folks to live, folks got to give, folks got to care, ooh, folks got to share. everyone and welcome to another edition of Folks. Today we conclude our discussion on aging with a look at some of the physical difficulties that the elderly face. Here's Sonia Massengale. The study of aging has taken on new scope with medical improvements in the treatment of body and mind. Today we'll talk to several experts in the field of gerontology who will offer their views on care for the aging. Dr. Paul Kim, a professor of social work at Louisiana State University, specializes in gerontology research and methods. He says that social isolation and subtle age discrimination are negative factors affecting senior citizens. Uh, the psychosocial problems uh, in old age, uh, we can say the first, they are isolation from the society and uh, their feeling of uh, rolelessness because our country is uh, the very production-oriented, activity-oriented, motion-oriented, and if you slow down or inactive or you're not productive uh, uh, or contributing to the society and you feel that I'm no longer useful, a type of a feeling that sets in to the older person's mind. A second one is uh, the uh, society is not able to provide them to be uh, be involved and uh, that's where the age discrimination sets in and uh, a lot of uh, the uh, uh, organizations uh, the public agencies even uh, private uh, the business people they think old age is uh, is not capable as they have been therefore uh, they don't want them to be around. So the, they, they subtly discriminate them, giving them a job or giving them a good uh, promotion, pay scale, all that. So that uh, being frustrated, uh, the older persons are, uh, then uh, they react in such a way, absolute withdrawal. And uh, so those kind of is the problems that's in. What role does money play in this process? Yes, the money in this country is talks everything. Uh, however, it's, uh, as far as uh, I can see, the money is not the big problem. Uh, the money doesn't solve the, uh, uh, all old age problem, you see. The, the problem that I see is, is uh, the, uh, the how uh, the society accept old age as a normal process of a human development and uh, uh, the respect to their process and uh, the try to live together and then help each other type of attitude is the real problem. If money is not the problem, then how do we combat these problems? What I like to see is the, the public and the and the American people think aging as a normal life cycle process 
everybody will reach there. That's the final destination. Um, therefore, uh, they have some commitment to older persons that we're going to live together, we're going to help each other, we grow older together. Type of a mindset we need. If you have such a philosophical mindset in you, then the help comes through automatically, exerts your care, uh, loving, you know, to all the person through policy making or through your neighbor or through your social clubs and churches. You know, you can do those things, you know, the care of all the persons. Uh, doesn't need a million dollars to care of all the persons. You know, if, you, you, if you're a neighbor, for example, uh, you see uh, he or she needs help. And if you have a commitment to that person, although you don't have the money, you can help that person. Dr. Tim Holt is a geriatrician, so his practice of internal medicine is primarily concerned with the medical care and treatment of the elderly. But how do we find old? What is old? Are you old when you retire? Are you old whenever you feel old? Social Security says that you're old at 62, you're older at 65, and you're oldest at 72. For statistical purposes, old is usually defined as an age of 65, and the very old are usually defined as people who are greater than age 75. Since geriatrics is a relatively new medical specialty, a large part of Dr. Holt's practice involves educating the public about care okay. for the aging. I think one of the first things you can look at are statistics, and you know, realizing there are only statistics and you may be the one that's affected. but. Nationally, people are, who are 65 and over, about 5 to 10 percent at any one time are in a nursing home. Um, outside of a nursing home, it's been much more difficult to get at the population to determine exactly how many of those are disabled or have really crippling conditions. But what we try to look at is a, an index of what's called activities of daily living. And what that is is just an index of how well can you function in the community. Can you do your own shopping, do your own housekeeping, and that type of thing as a measure of, of independence. And I'm not positive these are statistics, but I'm, you know, roughly. Um, for people over 65, again, about maybe 10 to 12 percent have some form of disability that impairs their activities of daily living. And it's not really until you reach old, old age, 75 or 80, do those statistics approach higher, like 30 percent or so, that interferes to the point that you've got some functional disability that causes trouble. Um, so, you know, it, it's not really a picture of gloom uh, to get older. That even if you take the higher percentage across the board, 30 percent, that means that 70 percent of the people out there are going to remain functionally independent until they die. And um, that doesn't mean that they're free of disease, because they're not. They're going to have chronic diseases. They're going to have problems. But they're not going to be chronic diseases that are going to debilitate them. It may interfere with their activities a bit, but it's not going to make them bed bound. It's not going to make them at home. And it's not really going to interfere to the point where they have trouble taking care of their lives. What are some of the most common ailments of old age? OK. Some of the most common ones um, are um, probably strokes, heart disease, or atherosclerotic type diseases, which would include the strokes, heart disease, um, hardening of the arteries, peripheral vascular type disease, diabetes, um, people who have uh, lung disease, um, pulmonary type things, um, and then going on down the line, uh, people who have mental disorders um, like dementia and things like that. But the three major causes of death would be from cardiovascular diseases mostly, um, strokes, heart attacks, and then um, cancers. But cancers are not really all that high on the list. And probably out of all of them, the major fear, even more than the disease, is a fear of becoming disabled from the disease or becoming to the point where somebody has to take care of you. And again, we go back on the other statistics. It's not all that high. And I think the major one out of them are dementia. And um, I, I can't remember the statistics exactly, but I think it was around 12 percent of the people will develop some form of, of dementia when they get older. But that doesn't mean it's a, it's a dementia that, that's going to be severe. And it certainly is going to take a while 
to develop and getting into it. So again, it's not, it's not that gloomy, you know, but there are ways to deal with it also if it does occur. How can we prepare ourselves for the physical aspects of aging? You can't really prepare for the actual physical aspects because, you know, physiologically we're still doing a lot of research about what is normal aging, what's normal, what's not normal, you know, and what happens. Um, in terms of preparation, I think the best thing is, you know, to start when you're in your teens or your 20s, um, back at that point in time with good diet, good control of, of um, blood pressure, things like that. But short of the fact that, you know, if you're already 55 or 60, you're not going to go back to age 20. It's physically impossible. So what can you do now? Well, I, I think what you have to realize is if you've got a chronic disease, like, say, high blood pressure, diabetes, heart disease already, if you already have it, is, number one, to realize that we can't cure those diseases, that um, we can treat them, we can make the symptoms less, and we can hope to lessen the impact of the disease, but we've got to get cure out of the mind because you can't really cure them. So what can we do? Well, if you have one of the chronic diseases and you need, you know, what are you going to do when you're older? Um, follow the advice of, of what's given. Um, try and keep your blood pressure down. Try and exercise because exercise certainly helps to increase vascular circulation. It, if you happen to be a diabetic, exercise and good diet has been shown to help decrease the incidence of that. And that's just kind of a general overall statement for anybody at any age. Diet and exercise is very good. Um, specifically for retirement, reaching things like that, um, know specifically what your diseases are. Know um, what's, what's expected of it. Know, know when you might get in trouble with something. Um, say, for instance, you have high blood pressure. Know the signs of when the blood pressure might be elevated. Um, blood pressure disease is one of the masqueraders you feel comfortable most of the time. Um, talk to your doctor about the side effects of the medications. Know, you know, know what's expected of you. Know what, what's going to happen with it and know when to seek help with it and, and when it's, you know, a, a normal occurrence. The phenomenon called aging varies greatly from one person to another. The quality of life in our later years is largely dependent on our attitudes and awareness of our particular needs. Nobody stays young forever, but thanks to our sociologists, psychologists, and physicians, the quality of our lives is getting better along with our longer lifespans. Thanks, Sonia, for that report. Okay, time now for a question from the folks' almanac. This New Orleans attorney served as a mentor to Mayor Dutch Morial. To many, he was considered Mr. Civil Rights in the Crescent City. Who was he? We'll have the answer for you later in the program. Louisianians have always had a preoccupation with photography, and that interest has spanned more than a hundred years now. It all began with the discovery of the daguerreotype process. The daguerreotype process was brought to Louisiana back in 1839, about six months after it was invented. A commercial a portrait artist whose name was Jules Leon, who was a black man, he's referred to uh, as a free man of color, uh, was able to uh, learn about this process and he exhibited his photographs, his daguerreotypes, March 15th of 1840. Herman, how popular was the daguerreotype here in Louisiana back in the 19th century? Well, of course, early on it was quite miraculous. It was as revolutionary in the 19th century as television was uh, in the 20th century. Uh, of course, a lot of the early equipment associated with the process of photography was quite bulky. It was not the efficient, portable process that we know it today. So that um, it was not until really in the 1880s when uh, um, George Eastman uh, developed the Kodak camera, that camera, that cameras and photography became very, very popular. We have, for instance, uh, a wonderful and very large camera club being organized in New Orleans in the 1880s. It was one of the ten largest camera clubs in the United States. And, you know, uh, it was extremely popular. People would make whole outings out of the photography process. Uh, the camera clubs would plan a, a day trip and they would go out into the landscape, countryside, and uh, make pictures of churches, uh, interesting public buildings, plantation homes, and so on. They'd come back to the city, they'd have a big dinner party in the evening and sort of celebrate uh, the activities of the day. And then they often would share one dark room that the club collectively had put together. And they would process their images. And uh, in fact, their early motives 
were to uh, bring to photography, they said, high artistic standards. Muir has put together a collection of Louisiana photography that spans a hundred years. The title of the exhibition, A Century of Vision, Louisiana Photography, 1884 to 1984. The inspiration for this show came in 1975. Um, I was involved in uh, organizing and designing the Louisiana Bicentennial Exposition, which happened in Paris in 76. In order to prepare for that show, I made a trip down to New Orleans, to the Louisiana State Museum, to a, a place called Madame John's Legacy, where an exhibition had been organized uh, of the images of George Francois Mounier, and I saw this remarkable picture. And it's called Moss Covered Live Oaks, made around 1890. And I, I was just amazed at this image. I had never seen anything quite like it before. This image for me really transcended the normal documentation that we associate with photography. And I saw here really a, a beautiful image, a rather spiritual image. And this was coming from photography. And um, the image stayed with me. In 1981, I had the idea of organizing a show uh, to send to French Canada, as you know, uh, both the Council for the Development of French in Louisiana and the Quebec delegation are headquartered in Lafayette. And we're very conscious of trying to organize exchange programs with the French provinces in Canada. So I had this idea to do a show which could uh, communicate some ideas about Louisiana, about our uniqueness, about the beauty of this place. And I said to myself, well, what are our strong visual traditions? Architecture is certainly one of them. And photography, as I discovered, was another very strong tradition. That's how the idea began. The themes found in many of the early photographs are quite limited. It, you know, it was much easier, for instance, to photograph architecture than it was to photograph individuals. When we look at some of the old portraits, you realize how frozen and how still the people seem to be. The early process did not allow a rapid exposure of film, uh, and so people had to sit still for a long, long period of time in order for that image to be registered on the photographic plate. Often we see pictures of buildings, for instance, where, of course, the buildings are still. If people in, uh, are moving in front, they're harsh-drawn carriages, for instance, that are moving, we often either don't see them at all or we see a kind of a ghost-like image simply because those moving uh, persons and animals did not stay still long enough to register on the photographic plate. Early on, uh, you know, so then you do get records of, of architecture and, uh, and um, individuals. The exhibition consists of 152 images by 24 Louisiana photographers. Photographers such as Francis Benjamin Johnston, and Clarence John Laughlin. Laughlin was born in Louisiana in 1905, and he died about a year ago in January of 1985. Being a very romantic, uh, uh, having a very a mind that really leans towards the kind of romanticism you get in French literature of the 19th century, a preoccupation with symbolism and so on, uh, Laughlin began to speculate on the lives of the people who had lived in these homes. Uh, and having this tendency towards uh, surrealism, being preoccupied with the world of dreams and afterlife, he began to imagine, in fact, that perhaps phantoms or spirits of these people still inhabited these homes. And so uh, he manipulates the medium of photography, often using double exposure, multiple exposure, uh, often dressing up a, a female figure in these kind of very dramatic and theatrical black robes with black veils. And again, the suggestion that they are the spirits that occupy these, these marvelous houses. Elmore Morgan, Jr., better known as a painter, is one of the contemporary photographers whose works is included in the show. The photographs of mine in this show are all color, and they're Cibachrome prints made from 35 millimeter color slides, and they're just out of my files. And I think all the photographs, and yes, all of them, were taken sort of in the region where I live. I live about 20 miles southwest of Lafayette, although I teach here at USL, and uh, I live in what's known as the prairie terrace of, of Louisiana. It's true prairie country, rice-growing country, sort of near Abbeville, Kaplan, Maurice, that area. And I've painted out there for years. There's something about that landscape that held me since I was a child. My mother's from Abbeville, and I would travel there and see it. And so these paintings uh, the, uh, that I've done out there uh, have sort of, in a sense, uh, resulted also in these photographs. Elmore Morgan, Jr. 
The exhibition will be on display through February 28th at the University Art Museum located in Fletcher Hall on the University of Southwestern Louisiana campus in Lafayette. Okay, time now for our Pause for Pride report, which this week features an outstanding and talented woman from Baton Rouge. The first black woman to sing for Louisiana Governor's inauguration, Fran Marsh Ellis has been first in many things. A talented dramatic soprano who found her gift at an early age, Frances Marsh Ellis is a versatile and remarkable woman. Chairman of vocal music at the Southern University School of Music, she somehow finds time for community service work with Delta Sigma Theta Sorority, The Lynx Incorporated, the Baton Rouge Arts and Humanities Council, Baton Rouge Public Radio, the National Afro-American Crafts Conference, and many more national and local organizations. I've always believed in the significance of the Negro spiritual. As a child, I was taught these spirituals, and I continue to learn them and to hear the great singers of our day, Marian Anderson, Dorothy Mayner, Leontine Price, these happen to be some of my favorites, but they sang these songs. And when I used to go and sit and hear Marian Anderson, for example, it was an experience that I could never, never, never explain. She would sing her German leader, she would sing her art songs and her other presentations magnificently well. But when she sang her Negro spirituals, there was a certain reverence, a certain awe that just came across. You call yourself an activist, an arts activist. How do you combine arts with activism? The one thing about the arts, and most assuredly music, is that you are working with natural beauty, that which is universally accepted, universally appreciated, persons of all colors, all races, all religions can be exposed to music and to the arts and can learn to love one another through the arts. I am, of course, first and foremost, a musician. But because of my background, my appreciation for all phases of the arts is very keen. It is necessary to understand that all of them can be meld together. And the way to get to people is to get to the hearts of people. And the best way to do that is through music and the rest of the arts. Frances came to Louisiana from New Jersey in the late 1950s. Since then, she has produced, directed, and performed in a multitude of musical productions, often involving interracial activities for the first time in Baton Rouge. In 1976, she coordinated the first amateur production of Porgy and Bess, and she was one of the founders of the Baton Rouge Blues Festival. She is committed to developing the arts in Louisiana. I think that in Louisiana, we must be proud wherever we go of the fact that we do have such a rich culture. Listening to persons of all ages, uh, hearing them talk about their experiences in the arts, um, seeing some of the magnificent handwork done by our senior citizens, the marvelous quilts that are made, the handwork, the wood carvings. Because you see, we must not forget our senior citizens. They're very important. They contribute to our being, and we learn the with all sorts of enthusiasm, the wisdom of our senior citizens. We learn that they contributed to the arts. They did their thing to try and open up and pave a way for us as human beings. What's in the future for Fran Marshallis? 
to continue to produce good students. Certainly, I want to continue to sing, but I am definitely interested now more and more in producing. And I would very much, if I had my wish, I would be in a situation where I could produce talent, produce, give, give a, a showcase uh, experience of the talent throughout the state. Fran Marsh Ellis, another black Louisianian who gives us reason this Black History Month to pause for pride. Okay, time now to answer the question from the Folks Almanac. The question again, this New Orleans attorney served as a mentor to Mayor Dutch Morial. To many, he was considered Mr. Civil Rights in the Crescent City. Who was he? Well, the answer is the late A.P. Turo. Well, that's our program for this week. Thanks for watching. Next week, another Pause for Pride report featuring young Kenneth Mack of Natchitoches. Be sure to check it out. Until then, have a safe and happy Mardi Gras, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.